Hello everyone, how are you all? Welcome to First Aid AMC MCQ. And we meet again. So we'll start with our cardiology session tonight. And that's one of the most important topic for medicine in case of your AMC MCQ. And all of us already know about the mode and format of MCQ exam as we have been discussing in our last two trial sessions. And tonight, officially, we are going to start our new five months AMC MCQ course. And it's good that you guys are going to get two weeks free sessions, but please remember that these two weeks free session is also included in the five months course. That means we are taking the exact same class for our course students, and you're just getting an idea about how we usually take classes. And that helps a lot to understand the way it, a course actually is going to help you or not. Like, I can take one, one good class, okay? I'm obviously good in one or two topic, and I can just take one class or two class, and then I can show all of you that, well, we take a very good class. And what happens that after four or five classes, you got to understand that, no, it's not worthy of taking, a, taking this course. It's just killing my time. So I have heard a lot of, lot of, lot of candidates saying in that way, they, they went, went to another course or they went to somewhere. They felt initially like this can be helpful because they just got one, one free class to join. All right, and that was obviously the best class for anyone who is going to give you one free class or two free classes, that's not, that obviously would be the best class that he or she can take. So I would always say that before joining anywhere in your, in your life, okay, like if you want to learn something new, always at least get first one or two weeks free sessions from them so that you get to know them. And then obviously no one can take two weeks classes, like all the classes will be good. If you like all the classes, then only join. Otherwise, don't join it. It's my personal view. All right. So that's why I, sub, I initially also, I used to give just only one or two free sessions. And then I got to understand the, my view because I also, like all of us as a doctor, need to upskill our experience, upskill our knowledge, okay, in our own positions. So all of us get those sort of courses, those sort of ideas and everything. So I understand from some, somewhere else that no, it's not just one or two class which can be helpful for someone to understand a whole five months course. So that's why I started giving the two weeks free sessions in this year, I guess. So now you get two weeks free sessions. We will cover cardiology mostly and also some of the question solvation class we will get. And depending on that, you might understand that this is helpful or, or you can also understand that this is not helpful for you and then you can decide. So that's why this two week free session is on from tonight. And I guess all of you got the schedule of our sessions. Okay, now I want you to know one thing that this two week sessions means that you can join all these two week sessions without any need of any payment or anything. But after this two week session is over, if you want to continue, please make sure you talk with us over email or through our messenger that you want to continue. Otherwise you will just miss the next classes. All right, good. So let's start then. Before we start, we'll just go through the cardiology like how the cardiology physiology works. In just one minute time, we will just get to watch this video. Yes, you will be getting the recordings in our software. All right, so usually we give the recordings in the software after 24, within 24 hours of a class. Now you should be able to get the free classes recordings through YouTube that has been continuously getting uploaded in your Facebook group, right? So. If, if anyone joins the course and make the payment, then they get the recording in their software and all other course materials and stamps. So let's go through these videos and then we'll start our session tonight.
So this this fairly one minute video shows exactly how our heart works, right? So it's a very really important thing to understand the pathophysiology of how our heart works to understand the whole topic. It's really important. I can't say enough how important it is to understand how this whole thing works. If you don't understand, and if you just memorize, never ever you will understand like how amazing this system works, okay? To give you a just a basic idea about cardiology, that means how the heart physiology works, let's just go through that very quickly. And throughout the classes, we'll go through that once again. So let's say this, this thing is your heart. Obviously, this should not be like that. It's my drawing is so bad, that's why. So this, let's say this is your fourth chamber of the heart. Okay, so, and that's your right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, okay? Now the blood should come from your extremities and also from your like upper and lower extremities. So from upper extremities, from the superior vena cava, blood will come to your right atrium. Let's say this is your superior vena cava. And from your lower extremities, inferior vena cava will bring the bloods. And these bloods will be deoxygenated blood, which means it will mix, like it will actually contain carbon dioxide bloods. Then, so SVC and IVC will bring all the deoxygenated blood to your heart, which means in your right atrium. And through right atrium, there is your tricuspid valve. And from the tricuspid valve, it goes into the right ventricle, so RV. It still contains your deoxygenated blood. So that means the right side of the heart contains deoxygenated blood. From the right ventricle, blood is supposed to go through the pulmonary valve in here. Through the pulmonary valve, it goes through the pulmonary artery into your lungs, right? And when pulmonary artery takes the deoxygenated blood into the lungs, in the lungs, it gets oxygenated. The whole process of oxygenation we will discuss in respiratory system, not cardiology. So it gets oxygenated in your lungs and then through the pulmonary vein, oxygenated blood will come to your left atrium through the left atrium, the blood will move to your left ventricle through, through the mitral valve. So that's, that's your mitral valve in here. So oxygenated blood from the lungs carried by your pulmonary vein, okay? And then it comes to the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, it will go to the aorta through the aortic valve in here. And from the aorta, the blood will be distributed in your whole body. So that's how your whole body will receive oxygenated blood. So this is the whole idea, right? Like how this system works. Now, if you understand just this much, a lot of things you will get to understand in our today's session also. Today's session is not mainly based on these valvular disorders or like the heart failures, which is very important for this one. Today, we are going to mainly focus on chest pain and what are the causes of chest pain and what are the management and the investigation related to chest pain. Before we move to that, what are the resources that we will follow for cardiology? That's important to understand. So for Theory, the most important thing is your JM 7th edition. So you have to always follow this one. Then throughout our course, we will also follow the Kaplan step to CK for each of the topics that we are going to discuss. Like for cardiology, we will also follow Kaplan step to CK. E-medicine or Medescape, it's a very good guideline about your medicine topics. So anything you want to know in detail, you can just search it in the Google and just write e-medicine. And this is 
important because a lot of you even don't know how to search these things in Google and how to get an answer properly. So that's also one, one of the important things. So let's say we want to know about ST elevated MI. What, how we will search it. So we'll just search e-medicine. And then Google will take you to e-medicine Medscape article. So you just open this one. And then you can just read it, right? So it's a very cool thing and it's a free thing. So you just read everything that you want to know from here. So presentation, definition, background, differentials, workup, treatment, everything is here. So you just want to read it, this one to get your knowledge more better than what you used to know before. That's an important thing. How, like everything in the Google, you will search in this way. I know like lots of you are thinking that I know how to search it, doctor, why you are showing it? Because I know that some of you don't, okay? So that's your gem, then Kaplan, then e-medicine or Mediscap, RACGP or AJGP. This tool has very important and up-to-date guideline about most of the medicine topic that you can think about. And RACGP is the Australian guideline. This is the only Australian guideline you might get for medicine. So search it. Like if you want to know something about chest pain, just write chest pain RACGP guideline. Or you don't find out in the RACGP guideline, you just search in this way, chest pain Australian guideline. So you, you have to understand how to search this thing. If you don't even understand how to search, you will not get to know these things. And you don't get the idea about reading in the online and improve your knowledge. There is no limitation of knowing these things. And this is a continuous development of your knowledge. Med bullets, we will also follow med bullets. It's a concise and a small discussion about the topics. So on and off, we will also follow this website. Once you join our course, you will also get a free QBank and you can go through the cardiology QBank questions. After reading this theory, then you go to the QBank. Never ever start with QBank and just going through the explanation. It never helps. I've seen a lot of candidates just going through the QBank and thinking that they will pass the exam. Well, if you are really, really lucky, you might pass the exam, but that's, I would say that that's, that's a risk that you don't want to take. And I don't suggest anyone to do that. All right. So you need to have a very good theory knowledge. That knowledge should be implemented in your questions. And then you can read the QBanks just to see how, how this theory knowledge is working. And you can also see where you are lacking and what you need to improve. So that's fine. But don't start with QBank. This is not a not a like not something you just memorize because the questions doesn't come from QBank or not from anywhere, okay? So you need to have a very good theory knowledge, then you can only get those questions answered correctly in the exam, okay? And then we have our lecture notes also, so obviously we will go through that during our discussions. And after you have done all these things, so you start with your theory and you, you go through the QBank and then in the software, you have cardiology mock exam. So once you join the course, you get all those exam. So you just go through, like you finish everything and then you see that how well you are prepared in terms of cardiology. So just you, then at the end, you go through that exam and you see that, well, now I know better or not. That's the important part, okay? So this is how, each and every topic that we are going to discuss, you should go through in that way. After the cardiology theory session, I will also take a cardiology question solvation class. That means all the cardiology questions, I, I, I will try to discuss most of the important questions and things that, that is important for the exam. And that's how you will also understand how the questions should be solved or how the correct answers should should, should be found out in a question where there are lots of clues, where there are lots of uh, like 
lots of tips and tricks are there. And there are traps in the exam questions, right? So you need to find out and try not to fall on those traps in the exam. So this is how we should do our preparation. The preparation is not just solving particular questions or not just going through the QBank. It's never ever a preparation for any exam. For someone who is doing that, or for someone who is suggesting that, they're just showing you the wrong pathway. Okay, it's not the stop of your journey for Australian, uh, for being a doctor in Australia. Okay, maybe you might get, get to pass this exam just by going through those sort of things. But eventually you need those knowledge to, to go forward in your career, right? So you should never ever bypass those things. It's not mandatory, Dr. Sabbi, so, but it's an important part of your preparation. You should, you should read Step to CK because it gives a very concise and very good information about most of the important topics. But it's not mandatory, I would say. Nothing is mandatory. So starting with the chest pain. So what happens with the voice? Is my, not, is my voice is not clear? Who said? Uh, I don't know what's your name, AMB? Everyone really? It should be clear because I don't know why there is distortion, what sort of distortion you're getting. Try to see that maybe in your end, uh, you might just see that if you're using any microphone or not, okay? So try to switch the microphone or if you're not using microphone, then try to use that. See that if it helps, it should be clear. Okay, all right. We're starting with the chest pain, what are the, what are the main causes of chest pain? It's not only cardiac related, always remember that. Chest pain can come from a lot of other areas. So it could be cardiac, obviously, so in case of cardiac related, chest pain can be due to myocardial infarction, can be just a stable or unstable angina, which is also ischemic heart disease, but we will go through each and everything later on. It could be pericarditis, which is the inflammation of the outer layer of your heart. It could be prolapse of the mitral valve as well. But these are the most important one. Aortic stenosis, sometimes also presents with chest pain or chest tightness. So that's your more or less important questions. Then vascular aortic dissection is important. Come to the respiratory system related chest pain. Would be pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, pneumothorax. Then GIT related, important is gastroesophageal reflux and peptic ulcer disease. Musculoskeletal, it could be due to fracture rib. Remember, fracture rib gives a severe form of chest pain. It could be disc prolapse causing compression over the cervical nerve root, and that's causing the rib pain on your chest. Could be costochondritis. In costochondritis, patient says that their chest is sore to touch or tender to touch, and that's an important clue to costochondritis. And also neurological, like if someone having herpes zoster, that can also present with a chest pain. But if it's herpes zoster, you will always get a vesicular rash. Okay, so vesicular rash and pain over the chest, and it's just a dermatomal area of the chest is getting the pain, then it could be a herpes zoster related. So for someone who is having chest pain, we should always think about either it could be coming from heart, can come from respiratory system, GIT system, musculoskeletal system. Okay, now different type of chest pain suggest different form of causes. Let's say someone having ischemic heart disease, which includes both angina, and acute coronary syndrome. For someone who is having angina or acute coronary syndrome, chest pain is usually described as feeling tightness, heaviness, or pressure, or someone is kind of squeezing the chest, constricting the chest, something like that. 
and the pain of ischemic heart disease is very severe and it always occurs on the left side of the chest and that can radiate to the jaw to your left arm and even to the shoulders okay we'll go more into the discussion about it later on just moving on so if it is coming from ischemic heart disease then the chest pain character will be tightness heaviness or pressure or constricted if it is due to pericarditis patients say it's a kind of knife like or sharp chest pain okay if someone's chest pain get response or patient complaining of chest pain and you have given nitroglycerin or gtn spray and that patient responded to gtn or nitroglycerin there are two main reasons that can happen one it could be just a stable angina so it could be ischemic heart disease or second one that it could be esophageal spasm so this two gets better with the nitroglycerin but someone having chest pain and you have given gtn spray or tablet and that chest pain get worse and that could be related with gastroesophageal reflux disease so that's important sometimes along with chest pain patient with ischemic heart disease can have some other features what are those other features patient can present to you with dyspnea or shortness of breath patient can have a fear of dying patient can have excessive sweating they can feel dizzy okay they can also have feeling of nausea or vomiting so nausea vomiting excessive sweating shortness of breath these are all features of myocardial infarction see the diaphoresis tachypnea anxious expression should always alert a clinician to potentially life threatening process now come to some other physical examination findings in physical examination finding sometimes you can get features which can help you to understand a particular disease like someone you have found out that this patient's ecg is showing left bundle branch block now i know that this term is not quite catchy for you or it might be new for you even so left bundle branch block someone doesn't have any st elevation in their ecg so it's not st elevated mi doesn't have any any other ecg changes in terms of ischemic heart disease but only thing that you have found out that that patient having left sided chest pain and sudden onset okay but new onset of left bundle branch block in their ecg that suggests acute mi okay so important finding that we should remember a new fourth heart sound can also occur with angina or myocardial infarction but someone having s3 gallop rhythm so normally your heart sound should be s1 and s2 one when like usually occurs during systole and diastole of of the heart so that s1 s2 heart sound is normal for everyone but there are two other abnormal heart sound one is s3 and another is s4 someone having s3 gallop rhythm that's probably due to underlying congestive cardiac failure someone having s4 new fourth heart sound that's going with angina or infarction so these are the clues you will be looking for in the exam okay we are not moving into all the other features i'm going with your just the introduction of the chest pain the presentations and everything and then we will move into the main topic okay so don't think that this is the finishing of the chest pain class no for someone having a chest pain what is your first test that you will order all is ecg that is the most important test 
That is the single most initial test. So everything is ECG. Anyone having chest pain, not only chest pain, a middle-aged patient or elderly patient complaining epigastric pain, you should always order an ECG to rule myocardial infarction. Why? Because sometimes epigastric pain can be due to a myocardial infarction also. So it's a very commonly asked question. Okay? So they want you to know that someone can present to you with epigastric pain, but that patient is having an acute MI. You should order an ECG. Okay? And the ECG findings in terms of myocardial infarction, we will discuss in our ECG sessions. Once you have done the ECG, let's say you have got some changes or you might not have got any changes, but the chest pain, the characteristic of the chest pain goes with angina or most importantly, myocardial infarction. So just like you might not get anything in the ECG. Will you stop there? No. You will obviously repeat the ECG again in three to four hours. But in the meantime, what you can do, you can order cardiac enzymes. So what are the cardiac enzymes that we order? So there are lots of cardiac enzymes, but the most important one is cardiac troponin. And that's the only thing that you need to order in here. Previously, we used to order CKMB. Okay, but nowadays only cardiac enzyme that we order is cardiac troponins. And again, let's say you did a cardiac troponin, but that is normal. Okay, so patient presented to you within one hour of having the chest pain. You did ECG, ECG comes normal. You did troponin, troponin is also normal. What is your next thing you will do? Will you stop or will you repeat it in, again in three to four hours time? You should always repeat it. At least two to three repeat troponin should be done before you send the patient home. Okay, so repeat ECG, repeat troponin is your answer for those things. Now, the important part that CKMB does not predict infarct size, but it can be used to detect any reinfarction. This is where I, am, I really want you to understand this part. So CKMB is a cardiac specific enzyme that will be elevated for someone having myocardial infarction. You will get it positive or you will get it detected in the blood of a patient four to six hours after the onset of chest pain. It get picked up in 12 to 24 hours and it get back to normal within two to three days. So four to six hours, you will be able to detect it and it gets normal in two to three days. Whereas your cardiac troponin Your troponin, it's also get into your serum in four to six hours, but it get back to normal in 10 to 14 days. Now, if someone having a reinfarction, if you do troponin, will it help? No, because it will get normal in 10 to 14 days. So let's say that you have got a patient who has been treated for ST elevated MI. So initially ECG showed ST elevation. Then CKMB was elevated, troponin was elevated, okay? And patient has been already treated. Now, again, in like in four days time, patient again started to having chest pain. Now you did troponin, it's elevated. Can it show that this patient having a new onset infarction or just the previous infarction? It can't show that, right? So. If you want to diagnose reinfarction for someone like this, you have to order a CKMB. So CKMB nowadays is only used for finding out this reinfarction possibilities. You can't do cardiac troponin to find out the reinfarction because it it's, it will be elevated 
up to two weeks after having a symptom onset or after having a chest pain. All right, so this is important to remember. And also previously we used to do myoglobin, which we no longer do at all. So either CKMB or troponin, but troponin is the best cardiac enzyme. Sometimes we might want to do a chest X-ray, but the chest X-ray is mainly for someone who is having respiratory related chest pain, but not for cardiac related. Now move on to more detailed causes of chest pain and how is their presentation. So chest pain obviously can be due to ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction. Other than myocardial infarction, it could be aortic dissection. Aortic dissection chest pain, why it is important to understand because it will be given in your stem or in your question that this is how the patient presented. And just by looking at the question and presentation, you have to know that what is the, what is the diagnosis they're talking about. So that's why it's important to know about it. So aortic dissection, patient present to you with a sudden onset of severe chest pain, which is kind of sharp, tearing, excruciating chest pain, and that get radiates to the back. Okay, so that's the important part. Any chest pain getting radiated to the back, we should consider aortic dissection. So sudden onset of retrosternal chest pain, which radiate to the back, feels like sharp, tearing, extremely severe pain, that's aortic dissection. And for aortic dissection, we will discuss about it later on, that how, how we will investigate and manage this patient. Pulmonary embolism, chest pain. Pulmonary embolism, it's not under cardiology today, but in the respiratory system, we will discuss it in detail. But just to remember, the pain is kind of pleuritic chest pain. What is pleuritic chest pain? The chest pain, which gets worse after taking a deep breath or after coughing. So that's pleuritic kind of chest pain. So if someone complains, that they are having a pleuritic kind of chest pain, and that can be right-sided also, right? So right-sided chest pain, which get worse after taking breath. With that, patient having tachycardia, tachypnea, hypoxemia, and shortness of breath, and having a history of risk factor related to pulmonary embolism, like a travel history, like a long flight history, or having a previous history of deep vein thrombosis or clot formation, so some of the risk factor, it will be given in your question. We'll discuss, discuss it in detail later on. But that's how pulmonary embolism present. Chest pain, which is pleuritic, with shortness of breath. And in the examination, you will get tachycardia, tachypnea, and low oxygen saturation. Come to the pericarditis chest pain. Very commonly get confused with myocardial infarction. So pericarditis, the pain is sharp and that can be knife-like stabbing kind of chest pain. And the pain, it has a particular feature that it gets worse on lying down or taking deep breath or coughing. So kind of pleuritic chest pain and positional chest pain. So pleuritic means the chest pain which get, which get worse after taking a deep breath or cough and positional means that when patient lie down, the pain gets worse. And when they lean forward, pain gets better. And most of the time, these pericarditis cages, they will give you that patient had a recent viral infection. So what happens in pericarditis, when patient develops this recent viral upper respiratory tract infection, the body tries to attack those virus. During those process, Okay, there is formation of antibodies. And somehow, like in, in the process of attacking those virus, your body also start attacking the pericardium. Okay, that's how the pericarditis pain can happen. So most of the time, viral illness can precede this chest pain. It's a very important finding. And on examination, you will get a pericardial rub, which sounds like kind of noise going on in the pericardium. 
also you will do ECG. ECG will show diffuse ST elevation. That means ST elevation in almost all leaves. If you do the troponin, normal. CK, normal. And if you just give some anti-inflammatory medication, patient responds well to that. All right. So that's your pericarditis, chest pain. Now, if you look at the, some other features and differentiating features of some of the other causes of chest pain, which is very important for exam, let's say costochondritis, the pain gets exaggerated with inspiration, that means taking a deep breath. And the most important finding, if you palpate the chest, you will get that patient having tenderness on their costochondriac region. So if any patient say that their chest is sore to touch or tender to touch, that's costochondritis, that is the possibility. Reflux, patient will say the chest pain comes after taking a hot, spicy food and that get relieved with taking some antacids. Peptic ulcer, it's an epigastric pain which get worse after eating. And that also can be associated with hot, spicy food. But how we differentiate ulcer and reflux? In ulcer, patient only will have this epigastric pain and kind of burning chest pain sometimes. But reflux patient, they have this bitter taste in their mouth. That means the reflux which is coming into their mouth. So water brush, some kind of um, bitter taste in the mouth. Okay, those are more common in reflux related chest pain. Myocardial infarction, it's important. We will discuss it in detail. Okay, just hold on. Always remember someone's having a chest pain which has the characteristic of myocardial MI and the pain persists more than 15 minutes, not even 10 minutes, pain persists for more than 15 minutes, you should always consider MI. Okay? Aortic stenosis, as I say, that in case of aortic stenosis, patient can also have chest pain, but patient along with the chest pain, they also say that they have shortness of breath on exertion. That means when they exercise or when they play, they get shortness of breath. And also they will have this dizziness or syncopal attack. That means loss of consciousness. So this is a triad of aortic stenosis, which will be given. And on the top of that, if you examine this patient, you will get a typical ejection systolic murmur in the aortic area, and that gets radiated to the neck. So that's aortic stenosis. Myocarditis is not important. Pericarditis we discussed. Aortic dissection is a sharp tearing pain that, that goes back or that gets radiated to the back. Mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse, always remember if, if it's a young female, with no cardiovascular risk factor coming to you with a chest pain. And during your examination, you got a mid systolic click murmur that's MVP or mitral valve prolapse. This is very important to remember because these are the clues will be given in your question. Then you have pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia. We will discuss those things in our respiratory system. Now come to the ischemic heart disease, which is our main topic today. We have been talking about ischemic heart disease a lot, right? Now, first of all, understand those sort of terms first. Someone having ischemic heart disease, it means that their heart blood pipe, which is the coronary artery, is not getting enough blood. And why it's so? because their coronary arteries is blocked or it has got some deposition of fatty substances, or you can just say atherosclerotic plaques like this. And this is your, let's say it's the lumen. This is the lumen of the coronary artery. And their coronary artery is getting this atherosclerotic plaque. And this atherosclerotic plaque can get progressed and eventually it can totally block 
the coronary artery. And if, you, if the coronary artery is totally blocked, your heart will not get black blood supply. If your heart doesn't get blood supply, that's the time we call it myocardial infarction. All right? So this is a progressive thing. If we don't act first, this will progress eventually. So ischemic heart disease is a group of disorders which, which includes all this processing. So it could be stable angina, it could be unstable angina, and then it can be acute coronary syndrome also. Now let's move on. Someone can just have asymptomatic or clinically silent ischemic heart disease. That means you don't get any findings. The symptomatic one is what we will get and patient will present to you with chest pain. Now, if someone having chest pain, that means left-sided chest pain and all the features of MI will be there. So chest pain, which is left-sided and getting only during exertion, because what happens when you, ex when you do exertion, like right? let's say you are doing exercise, your body needs more blood and oxygen. On the top of that, your coronary blood pipes or coronary artery is already narrowed because of this atherosclerotic plaque. So when your body needs more oxygen, your coronary artery is not able to do that. And that's the reason during exertion, you get the chest pain. Okay, so that's your stable angina. Stable angina, the chest pain usually gets better after taking rest. And that doesn't persist more than 10 minutes. And also it gets better after taking a GTN spray or nitroglycerin spray. Then come to the acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome, we have three things under it. One is unstable angina non-ST elevated myocardial infarction and ST elevated myocardial infarction. In case of unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI, you will not get any ECG finding. That means ECG will be normal, but patient having characteristic chest pain. And in unstable angina, it means that patient getting the pain during exertion and pain is not getting better after taking rest, and also not fully better after taking a nitroglycerin tablet, and pain persisting for more than 10 minutes. So then it becomes acute coronary syndrome. Now it's differentiate these three without doing an ECG and a cardiac enzyme. So you did ECG after having this sort of chest pain. The ECG shows ST elevation then you call it ST elevated MI. You don't even need troponin to say that it's ST elevated MI. Okay, so that's your ST elevated MI. Now you did ECG, ECG is normal, no changes. Then what can be? So then it can be either unstable angina or it can be non-ST elevated MI. How you can say that this is unstable angina or non ST elevated MI? One single test can help you. Yes, you do the troponin. If troponin is elevated, that you, that then we call it non ST elevated MI. If troponin normal, then we call it unstable angina. It's very simple, right? So we have to do all these tests. Otherwise, we can't say which is non ST elevated, which is unstable angina. Okay, clear so far? Now come to the some of the risk factor, and then we'll go to go to some some investigation and management. So, what are the risk factor of having ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction? Lots of questions come from here. Can anyone tell me if I ask you which is the single most important risk factor of having a myocardial infarction? Or 
let's say ischemic heart disease, what's the most important risk factor? Read this line. Dyslipidemia, or you can say hypercholesterolemia. So hypercholesterolemia is the single most important cause of having ischemic heart disease. There is questions in your handbook. So I don't know if I have talked with you about the AMC MCQ handbook. That's also very important. Please start reading that multiple times. It has a lots of lots of questions. So I would advise you to read that and mainly read the explanations. Now, if anyone asks you what is the single most important risk factor of having myocardial infarction or cardiovascular complications, that's your hypercholesterolemia or dyslipidemia. Among dyslipidemia, LDL cholesterol is the most important one. Now, if someone asks you what is the single most important risk factor of having hemorrhagic stroke, that's your hypertension. What is the single most important cause of having ischemic stroke? That's again hypercholesterolemia. Because why this ischemic? Ischemia occurs because of having some atherosclerotic plaque. And how this atherosclerotic plaque forms by these cholesterols, right? So that's why this is the single most important risk factor. Obviously, others are also important, having a diabetes, high blood pressure, stress, everything that you talked, everything is a risk factor. But the most important one is hypercholesterolemia. If someone asks, what is the worst risk factor? Or you can say someone having diabetes and that patient having myocardial infarction, this diabetes is the single most factor of a bad prognosis for this patient. Or you can say that this is the worst risk factor for having a coronary artery disease. So three things can happen. One is single most important risk factor, that's hypercholesterolemia. Single most worst risk factor, that's diabetes. And most common risk, if someone asks, then you can say hypertension. So you need to remember the term. Let's go through this question. A 48-year-old woman comes to the office with chest pain that has been occurring over the last several weeks. The pain is not reliably related to exertion. Sometimes if in the question it says that pain is not related with exertion, it's very unlikely to be related with myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease because ISD pain always gets worse with exertion. She's comfortable now. Location is retrosternal. Pain is sometimes associated with nausea no shortness of breath, and doesn't radiate beyond the chest, no past medical history, what is the most likely diagnosis? So see this one, having chest pain, that's retroesternal, no radiation, not related with exertion. So you can immediately say it's not related with angina or anything serious, okay? And usually, like before menopause, women has very low risk of having coronary artery disease because the estrogen usually helps them not to have this sort of MI or any, any, like any ischemic event, you can say. But after menopause, they're in, they have increased risk. So that's your answer, gastroesophageal reflux disease. See that important to understand the pattern because if someone doesn't know, they will just say, no, it's an unstable angina. Okay, very important to understand the how they present. If it's a ischemic heart disease, first thing is it will be left-sided chest pain, not retrosternal. Second, it get radiate to the left arm, jaw, shoulders, those areas. Obviously, it's related with exertion exercise. Okay, 
So this is important finding that you will look for. We only discussed what is the single most dangerous to a patient in terms of risk for coronary artery disease. So LDLs, or sometimes they can ask you what is the most important risk factor of having a coronary artery disease. Now, one of the things that this is a new disease which causes chest pain. Let's have a look so that you don't get surprised in exam. A postmenopausal woman develops chest pain immediately on hearing the news of her son's death in a war. She develops acute chest pain, dyspnea, ST segment elevation in V2 to V4. If I, I have a look on this one, I would immediately say it's the ST elevated MI, right? Elevated level of troponin confirm an acute MI. Again, troponin is also elevated. So there is no doubt it could be an acute MI. Look at here, you did a coronary angiography, which is normal, including an absence of vasospasm on provocative testing. Now we go in, go in more deep now. So what coronary angiography do? In coronary angiography, you give a dye, Okay, and that, that dye can show the level of obstruction in the coronary blood pipes or coronary arteries. So if angiography is normal, that means there is no atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries or there is no blockage in the coronary arteries. So why this patient having ST segment elevation? Why this patient having high troponin? And they also said absence of vasospasm. Vasospasm is related with another form of angina known as fringe metal angina. In fringe metal angina, there is vasospasm that's causing the chest pain. We'll discuss about it later on. So no fringe metal angina, no infarction. So then you did an echocardiogram. And that's showing, it's a apical left ventricular ballooning is there. So that's your only finding. Now, you can't say it's acute MI if coronary angiography is normal. So what is this condition? This is called tachosubo cardiomyopathy, which occurs mainly in postmenopausal women immediately following an overwhelming, emotionally stressful event. Sometimes it could be like anything which can cause a stress. Okay, During a stress, there will be massive catecholamine discharge and that catecholamine, or you can say adrenaline, noradrenaline, that can cause this problem. And due to that, it leads to ballooning of the left ventricle and left ventricular dyskinesia. That means the left ventricle has some problem with their movement. As with ischemic disease, managed with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, Revascularization will not help since coronary arteries are normal. Okay, so it's mainly this is a condition in which coronary angiography shows normal coronary arteries, but patient having ST elevated MI, like ST elevation, having increased troponin, everything sounds like MI, but angiogram comes normal. Okay, so that's your tachosubo cardiomyopathy. You don't need to go in detail of it, just remember it. So we discussed about this, this one, acute coronary syndrome, how we get ST elevated, non-ST elevated, and unstable angina. Now, the important part to understand is that outcome or prognosis of having unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI is better than ST elevated MI. Why? Because in ST elevated MI, patient having the whole coronary artery is totally blocked. But in case of non-ST elevated MI, there is partial blockage. Even with unstable angina, that's partially blockage. Okay, it's not fully occluded. And that's the reason we go for thrombolytic therapy only for ST elevated MI 
and it is not effective in unstable angina or non ST elevated MI. And even it can be harmful. So that's an important thing to remember that thrombolytic therapy, like fibrinolytic therapy, we, we sometimes we need to do that in ST elevated MI, but we don't do that in non ST elevated MI. Okay, it's important because we are, we are moving into the management of ST elevated and non ST elevated AMI. So remember that non ST elevated AMI, no thrombolysis. Okay, just to give you a wrapping of what we have been discussing. So ischemic pain, the characteristic, if it's a stable angina, it's always less than 10 minutes. Acute coronary syndrome, more than 10 minutes. Provocating factor, physical activity, emotional stress, cold. Associated symptom, patient can have all these features as we discussed. Quality of chest pain, squeezing, tightness, heaviness, pressure. So these are all. Remember, burning chest pain is not ischemic heart disease. Burning chest pain is more related with reflux or GIT related chest pain. Don't think that it's a ischemic heart disease chest pain if in the question it says it's a sharp pain, stabbing pain or knife-like pain. Stabbing or knife-like pain is more commonly related with pericarditis chest pain. Okay, and chest pain gets better with rest in case of ischemia. And also we discussed, I think more or less, we already discussed all of it. So someone having chest wall tenderness, that's osteochondritis, pain radiating to the back, that's aortic dissection. Pain get worse with lying flat, better when sit up, pericarditis. Epigastric discomfort, pain gets better when eating, that's duodenal ulcer. Patient having cough, shortness of breath, sputum, pneumonia, sudden onset of shortness of breath, tachycardia, hypoxia, pulmonary embolism. Okay, so now you know about the basic investigation of ischemic heart disease, so, so which is your ECG, and then also the cardiac enzymes. Now let's say a patient coming to you with Angina kind of chest pain, all right? So angina, chest pain, that means it gets better within 10 minutes after taking rest. You did ECG, that's normal. You did troponin, that's also normal. But that patient has cardiac risk factor. Let's say that patient having hypertension, having family history of cardiovascular disorder. Patient is a smoker, sedentary lifestyle, okay? Or patient also, having a high BMI, diabetic, all these are high risk of having a MI or ischemic heart disease. So patient having angina kind of chest pain and they're having those risk factor, will you just stop there if their ECG and troponin comes normal? No. You might want to dig it a little bit more than that. So the next thing comes is doing a stress ECG or exercise tolerance test which we call in short ETT. So when your electrocardiogram is not diagnostic, everything comes normal, but with patient having an angina kind of chest pain, the next thing that you do is ETT. Now ETT, you don't need it to be done urgently. You can send the patient home and patient can come back for having an ETT in the cardiology outpatient unit. So that's okay. So ETT can be done in the outpatient. So Exercise tolerance test means patient will be exercising on a treadmill. And that means to send someone for ETD, you should be satisfied that this patient is able to exercise. Like someone who is having an amputation of their right knee, you should never ever send them for an exercise ETD, right? Or exercise tolerance test because they will not be able to run on a treadmill. So that's the common sense. So you have to understand that this is an exercise tolerance test. Now, sometimes you might also want to do 
some other form of like other form of cardiac testing. One of the testing is called nuclear isotope uptake, and another is called echocardiographic detection of regional wall motion abnormalities. Now this becomes a little hard for you, but let's let's discuss it in detail. Okay, you will understand it. There are two things that you see. First, see that are you able to read the ECG? That means ECG is totally normal. And is the patient able to exercise? If these two fulfills, then you can send the patient for an exercise tolerance test. Now, the problem becomes that ECG is not fully normal. There are some baseline ECG abnormality. In that case, you don't do ETT, rather you have to do either of these two. Either you do nuclear isotope scan, or you do the echocardiogram, okay? What are the baseline ECG abnormality? It could be left bundle branch block, left ventricular hypertrophy, patient using digoxin, patient is on pacemaker. So for these patients, you have to order any of these two. Now come to this thallium scan that we do. So in thallium scan, normal myocardium, which is the heart muscle, is supposed to pick up thallium in the same way that a potassium is picked up by the sodium potassium ATPase. The, the main thing is, if your myocardium is alive and perfused, that myocardium will eventually uptake thallium. So the isotope that you are giving, if myocardium is well perfused, it will take or it will uptake those thallium. If some part of the myocardium is not taking the thallium, that means that part of the myocardium is not getting enough perfusion. Then you look that that part of the myocardium is supplied by which arteries, okay? And then you know that, well, maybe this, this artery, like left coronary or right coronary artery, some part of that artery is not well perfused or some, some form of atherosclerotic plaque is there. So that's why we do a thallium scan. And the echocardiogram, in every contraction or systole that happens in your heart, myocardium moves. If myocardium doesn't move in some part, it means it's not getting enough blood perfusion. So we look for these wall motion abnormalities in the echocardiogram. Okay, so these are the things that you look for. So you, you, you know that if patient is able to exercise and patient doesn't have any baseline ECG abnormality, you do exercise tolerance test. Patient having baseline ECG abnormality, you cannot do ETT, then you do thallium scan or echocardiogram. Now, what if patient can't exercise? Then you can't do ETT. So if the patient cannot exercise, then alternate method will be this thallium scan, because in thallium scan, patient doesn't need to exercise. So one of the one of the things that you can do is this thallium scanning, or there are dobutamine echocardiography that we can do. So what we will do, we will give dobutamine, and dobutamine is supposed to increase myocardial oxygen consumption and that should provoke ischemia, okay? So if you give dobutamine and you do an echocardiogram, you might be able to see these regional wall motion abnormalities on the echocardiogram. So even if patient is not exercising, you are stressing the heart by giving this dobutamine, okay? So this is how you can go for it. So one of these is either thallium scan, which is actually myocardial, perfusion scan, MPS, you might hear about it. And another is this dobutamine echocardiogram. Now come to the whole point. It's important because sometimes in Australia, this is like very commonly used thing. So you, you need to learn about it a little bit. It's, a, it's the hardest thing that we are going to discuss tonight, but 
I'm trying my best to give you a basic idea so that at least if in the question it comes, you can understand what they're talking about. So let's say, what are the uses of this tolerance testing? So all these are your exercise tolerance test. Or you, what you are doing, your patient is at rest at the moment and you did ECG, resting ECG, it's normal. You did troponin, normal. But still you are not sure that this patient is having any underlying atherosclerosis or not. So then you want to stress that heart. So how you stress? You, you ask the patient to run on a treadmill. Then it becomes exercise testing or a stress testing. Now, what you're looking for? You're looking for when the patient exercise, does the heart shows any evidence of ischemia? Okay, so sometimes what you can get during those exercise or running on the treadmill, you, you are also checking the ECG. And you can get some baseline ECG abnormality like ST depression, TOF inversion. And those are the important findings that you are looking for during those tests. So exercise tolerance, it determines presence of ischemia. Exercise thallium. So inability to read the baseline ECG. So these are the indication mainly. So if patient is having some baseline ECG abnormality, then you can do the exercise thallium test or exercise myocardial perfusion scan. You can also do a, a stress or exercise echocardiogram. This means these three tests you can do in terms of exercise. Exercise tolerance test, which means that running on a treadmill only, you will do it if patient doesn't have any baseline ECG abnormality. If patient having baseline ECG abnormality, then patient will exercise, but you will not do this test, ETT, you will do either thallium scan or echocardiogram, okay? Now let's say patient is not able to exercise. Then you have to stress the heart from outside by giving some medication. So you can go for this dipyridamol thallium scan or you can go for dobutamine echocardiogram. Both of these two will work just like exercise. It will stress the heart, okay? So you can give these chemicals and then either thallium scan or echocardiogram you can do. These two only needed if patient is unable to exercise. Clear guys, any question now? Now let's have a look at this question. A man with atypical chest pain is found to have normal nuclear isotope uptake in the myocardium at rest. What is this nuclear isotope uptake, guys? This is your thallium scan we have been talking about. So thallium scan is normal at rest. On exercise, there is decreased uptake in the inferior wall. See that on exercise, sometimes you can get important finding. So on exercise, patient having decreased uptake. Two hours after exercise, the uptake returns to normal. So what does it mean? This patient having stable form of angina or patient having underlying atherosclerosis. So the next thing that you do when you get positive test, any of these exercise tolerance tests comes positive. Next thing you do, send the patient for a coronary angiography. Okay, so this patient having reversible ischemia on the stress test. This is exactly the person who needs coronary angiography. So coronary angiography will be able to show exactly how much blockage is there. And now we will know that this patient might get preventive treatment. That means you, if the patient having, let's say, 70% uh, stenosis or 100% block in the left coronary artery, okay? So what you can do, you can put on a stent and patient will never ever get a myocardial infarction because you did this coronary angiogram. So you are just preventing this thing to happen. So 
this is the stepwise approach, guys. It's very really important. Like sometimes you might not get AMI, but that patient can have underlying atherosclerosis. So you send the patient for this exercise testing. If reversible ischemia is there on the stress test, the next thing we do is the coronary angiogram. And depending on the coronary angiogram result, further management will be either just sometimes wait and watch. And most of the time, if there is high grade stenosis or blockage, the cardiologist will go for either a stent or bypass surgery. So coronary angiography is used to detect anatomic location of the coronary artery disease. And depending on its finding, we go for bypass surgery or angioplasty, which is the standing. So angiography is the single most accurate method of detecting coronary artery disease. So if, if they ask you, what is the single most appropriate test to detect coronary artery disease? That's your coronary angiography. Someone having less than 50% stenosis in their coronary artery, that's not significant. But if it is more than 70%, then it needs surgery or like it needs either surgery or angioplasty. So this is what we are talking about, guys. So you got a chest pain patient. And that patient, the resting ECG normal, everything comes normal but still you are suspicious. So what do you, you look for? So you look for, is this patient able to exercise? If yes, then you go for exercise stress test. Is this patient not able to exercise? Then you go for chemical stress test. Chemical stress test can be dipyridamol thallium scan or can be dobutamine echo. Okay? Depending on this finding, if it comes positive, then you go for angiography. In the angiogram, you get one or two vessel got more than 70% blockage. You go for angioplasty, which is putting on a stent. If patient got three vessel disease, that means three vessels has been blocked more than 70%, that patient will need CABG or coronary artery bypass grafting. Is this clear, guys? So lots of things should be going on in your head right now. So this is exactly what you need to understand in terms of chest pain investigations. It's a very, very important topic, okay? And it's not only important for your exam, but also when you will be working as a doctor in Australia, this thing will help you a lot, trust me. Next, you might be harding, you might heard about this term, halter monitoring. What is halter monitor? Halter monitor, it's a continuous, ambulatory ECG monitoring that records the rhythm and usually used for a 24 hour period. It mainly detects any rhythm disorder. That means if this patient having any, anything related with arrhythmia, could be atrial fibrillation, flutter, any, any ectopic like premature beats or ventricular tachycardia. Remember one thing, you should never do halter to detect ischemia. Okay, it's mainly only we do for rhythm evaluation. That means someone having dizziness, okay, or frequent episodes of syncopal attack. And you want to find out if this patient having any underlying uh, heart block or let's say ectopic beats, then you go for this halter monitoring. So halter monitoring is for arrhythmia, not for ischemia. Now let's move on to some of the important questions. So you have got a 48 year old woman, comes to the office with chest pain that has been occurring over the last several weeks. Pain not related with exertion, she is comfortable, retrosternal pain and ECG normal. What is the most appropriate next step in management? 
So what will you do? Now, I understand that we already discussed this one and we know that it could be a gastroesophageal reflux disease. That, does it mean that we will not do a ECG also? So they're asking what is the most appropriate next step? Now the problem is there is no ECG in here, right? So there is no resting ECG in your option. What else we have got? So if there is an ECG in the option, we would obviously do that, but that's not in your choice because they have already done that, right? So ECG is normal. So what you can do, let's see. So your answer is D. So exercise tolerance testing. So even though this patient might not have a condition like it's the pain is not going with angina, still, still because it's a 48 year old, we should always just do an exercise tolerance test just to be sure. Okay, that's the thing. Anyone having chest pain that is suspicious, we should always, always go for exercise tolerance testing, especially for this kind of cases. So you will do ECG, comes normal. Everything comes normal, then you can do an exercise tolerance test. There's the thing like we, it's a better idea to get to be safer. Okay, always remember it's it's a good idea to get to be safe in the in these cases. So if any if there is a thing like patient having chest pain, like a forty eight year, that's a middle aged woman, even though she might not have any risk factor, and the problem is in the options. Like sometimes if you actually feels that no, this patient is not high risk patient, nothing is abnormal, then you might not just you. You can leave it. You, you don't necessarily need to do an exercise tolerance test for everyone, okay? But in the previous options, there was no options of wait and watch or nothing like that. So we don't have any other things to choose from those options. That's the thing. In the exam question, sometimes option will be given, like the, the five options, nothing is actually appropriate. So you need, to, you need to at least choose one. Then what you can choose, that's the thing. But normally I would say in the previous system, normally it's not important for you to do those exercise tolerance tests. Rather, it's a good idea to do a ECG, just a baseline ECG, and then do a serum troponin. Okay, once we do those two tests, if patient is normal and we did a serial ECG, serial troponin, patient is also normal, then we don't need to worry about it because that patient's pain is not related with exercise. But again, that's the USMLE step two book they have discussed about in this way. But in my perspective, if there is an option, then we would not go for it. Okay, so better would be do an ECG and troponin. All right. So yes, uh, I don't. I, who asked? Troponin should be done in chronic cases as well. Again, uh, Dr. Mohammed, very good question actually. Is it done in chronic cases also? The thing is, we need to know a little bit more about this patient to, to know about their chest pain characteristic. Okay, so normally in those cases, again, we, we need to know about like how, like 
is this just pain happening for months and months? And is it related with exercise or is it related with food? So we need to know about a little bit more first to see that if this patient needs troponin or not. Someone coming to the hospital by an ambulance, having a chest pain, that patient will have both ECG as well as a troponin. Someone coming to you in a GP setting and patient having chest pain for a long duration on and off, we don't need to even go for troponin as long as we don't think that this is not something new onset chest pain or kind of different chest pain. So in terms of situations like that, we need more history, okay? And just not only one, one single line will never ever help us to find out what's the most appropriate approach for that patient, okay? So this is their answer. So enzymes are to evaluate acute coronary syndrome. Serial troponin measurements are done prior to a stress test. Echocardiography is to evaluate valve function and others. Exercise tolerance test is to evaluate a stable patient with chest pain whose diagnosis is not clear. ETT is not used in acute coronary syndrome in which patient is currently having pain. Do not put patient on a treadmill to exercise if they are currently having chest pain. Okay. So if patient currently having chest pain, we will not do a exercise tolerance test. So in my perspective, the question in here is not like very, very, very well written, just very like, I would say like not very appropriate, but if something like that comes in your exam, you have to choose something. Okay. Again, like, it would be a good idea in this case, if this patient is still having a chest pain and that has been occurring over the last several weeks, we need to know that at the moment patient having chest pain or not. Now see that she is comfortable now. That means she's not having chest pain, okay? So in this case, we can do an exercise tolerance test. But again, it's a good idea before doing exercise tolerance test, we should do a troponin at least. Okay, if they are asking what is the next step in management, we would go for troponin actually, if it comes in your exam. I would rather choose troponin rather than doing an exercise tolerance test first. Because it's always better to be safer. We don't know, like we don't play with chest pain in real life. General management, so come to the management of chest pain, which is pretty important. In someone having a chest pain, and if it comes as a case of ST elevated MI, then how we can manage that patient? So first of all, any patient having a possibility of acute coronary syndrome, ACS, so which can include unstable angina, non-ST elevated MI, ST elevated MI. The initial management will be more or less same like this. So what we will give to this patient, first of all, aspirin should be started with almost every patient unless they have any contraindication. Along with the aspirin, we also give clopidogrel. So it's a dual antiplatelet agents which we will start. Okay, so early treatment should be initiated with aspirin and clopidogrel, but avoid clopidogrel in patient likely to require emergency coronary bypass surgery. So someone going for a bypass surgery as an emergency one, we might not give clopidogrel at that time. Okay, because clopidogrel can increase the risk of bleeding. So better to stop clopidogrel five days before the surgery. Along with the aspirin clopidogrel that's usually given in acute coronary syndrome, DAPT, along with this dual antiplatelet, you should also start someone with this heparin. 
So you can give either unfractionated heparin or inoxaparin. Now, let me discuss the management of ST elevated AMI first, followed by non ST elevated AMI. Okay, and then we'll solve this question. For someone having a ST elevated AMI, or any kind of MI, we always start with a MONA therapy. What is MONA and which is the most important among MONA? This one, the last one, aspirin. Aspirin should be given first, not like not morphine, not oxygen, not nitroglycerin. If you need to choose between these four, you choose aspirin always because it has the cardiovascular mortality benefit. So every second that you are wasting, one of the, like some portion of the cardiac muscle is dying. So aspirin can prevent that. So that's why you should start aspirin as soon as possible. Along with the aspirin, patient having severe chest pain, you give morphine. Even after morphine, patient's chest pain is not getting better. You can give nitroglycerin. And if oxygen saturation is less than 94%, then you can give oxygen. Not every patient needs oxygen. It's a very, I've seen like very common mistake most of the candidates do. Okay, it's not like that. If saturation is low only, then you give oxygen. Now, in case of ST elevated MI, that patient having a full blockage of their coronary artery, right? So, some part of the heart is not getting any blood. And if you keep it like that for a few hours, eventually it will be fully dead and you cannot make it reversible at that time. So that's the reason ST elevated MI needs urgent reperfusion therapy. That means as soon as you have got the patient, you, you start this monotherapy and immediately send the patient for percutaneous coronary intervention which previously known as angioplasty with stenting. All right, so PCI is most important and the, this is the best treatment that you can do. So as soon as you got this patient with ST elevated MI, you have given aspirin and you don't wait for anything, not even for MON. You immediately call the catheter lab for PCI. Okay, and in the meantime, you can give this morphine oxygen nitrite. Let's say PCI is not available in the hospital you are in. What is your option? Will you send the patient to a tertiary hospital, which is four hours away, or you will go for thrombolytic therapy, like let's say some medication like altiplase, retiplase, those thrombolysis you will go for. So you should go for fibrinolysis or thrombolysis at that time. So you don't wait for four hours to send the patient to a tertiary hospital to have a PCI because four hours, that patient's already myocardium is getting dead every second. So you don't wait. You give thrombolysis, make the patient stable. Then if needed, you can send the patient to the tertiary hospital for further management. That's okay. All right, is this clear for everyone? Now come to the timing, which is very confusing for many of you because JM has made it confused, unfortunately. Now, two timing is important to understand. One timing is, let's say someone having a ST elevated MI, how long you can give or you can do either this PCI or fibrinolysis? What is the maximum time duration you can do this to? Anyone? That's the problem. I can see 90 minutes and I can see 12 hours. Now that's the confusion you guys are also in. As I said, two things that you need to remember. You can do PCI or thrombolysis up 
to 12 hours of onset of chest pain. Okay, so patient had a chest pain 6 a.m. in the morning after 12 p.m. in the afternoon, you can do PCM. So from the onset of chest pain, 12 hours is the maximum time you can go for either PCI or thrombolysis, both, any of these two, which one is available, you will go for it. Now, what is that 90 minute things? The 90 minute is also an important one. 90 minute is, you should do PCI within 90 minute of arrival in your hospital. A patient with a stay elevated MI entered into your hospital within 90 minutes. If you have PCI, you do PCI. And if you can't do PCI within 90 minutes, you go for thrombolysis. So that's 90 minutes is not maximum time. So that's the problem, guys. Like 90 minutes is one hour, 30 minutes. How many patients will come in one, one hour, 30 minutes? And you will not do PCA for those patients? That's ridiculous, right? And there's very nonsense also. So like no one actually follows in that way. So that 90 minute is once a patient has entered into your hospital and you know you, got, you diagnose that patient with ST elevated MI, you have to do a PCI within 90 minutes. It's not 90 minutes of chest pain. It's the 90 minute of first medical contact. Okay, now you might not believe because this is one of the complications that I, I know. So let's see, according to the Australian guideline, what they say. So this is your guideline of ETG guideline, which is actually like all the doctors in Australia, we follow these guidelines. So indications of reperfusion therapy, right? For a patient with significant ST elevation, or new left bundle branch block, we should always use reperfusion therapy. And you can start within the 12 hours preceding presentation. Okay, so within 12 hours, you can go for reperfusion. Reperfusion means either PCI or fibrinolytic therapy. But some patient, we can even do PCI after 12 hours like someone having continuous or persisting chest pain, even after 12 hours, we can go for PCI if cardiologist wants, and this patient is very high risk of having a complication. If patients having major complication from MI, like cardiogenic shock, and very unstable patient, okay, that patient you can go for PCI even after 12 hours. If PCI is available within 90 minutes of first medical contact, it is preferred over fibrinolytic therapy. If PCA cannot be delivered promptly, then fibrinolytic therapy should be given. What if in your center, PCA is not available and that patient having contraindication for fibrinolytic therapy? Then what you can do? Then you have to send that patient to a center where PCA is available because you can't do fibrinolysis to that patient. So what you can do? Okay, now it's clear. Any confusion? Yeah, so PCI is the 90 minute is the golden time. Don't get confused, okay? Now move on to some of the things which comes in exam frequently. And that's important also. A 70 year old, look at the A's, high risk patient already, comes to the emergency department, so obviously something serious, with crushing substernal chest pain for the last one hour. So one hour chest pain, that's always acute coronary syndrome already. 
your delay ECG shows ST segment elevation in V2 to V4. So that becomes your ST elevated AMI. You don't even need to do a troponin to confirm it. Remember it. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? What you will do? Next step. Remember what I said? The first thing that you do when you get ST elevated MI, give aspirin as soon as possible, guys. Don't, don't bother with troponin or anything. You give aspirin, then you think about other things. Okay, so this is what I am talking about. Aspirin lowers mortality with acute coronary syndrome, and it is critical to administer as rapidly as possible. And with only one hour, get any of these cardiac enzyme elevated. We will eventually give everything like morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, but they don't lower mortality, and it is not as important as aspirin. Okay. Now let's say the same patient, ST elevated MI, you gave aspirin. What is the next thing that you will do? And they're asking most appropriate next. Always remember most appropriate next means what is next? Next step. So you want to do troponin, oxygen, nitroglycerin, morphine, thrombolytics, metoprolol, atorvastatin, angioplasty, troponin, lysinopril. This is the thing that you will do. You, you give aspirin, aspirin, the next thing that's the most appropriate for this patient is angioplasty. Okay, so that's your answer because this is the greatest mortality benefit among all other steps. Okay, clear? So that's very important finding. Now let's say, you gave aspirin in this patient, okay? There is no ST segment elevation, but you did troponin and troponin came like sky high, like very elevated. What's your diagnosis? Non-ST elevated AMI, that's right. Not same diagnosis. Troponin elevated, but no ST elevation, non-ST elevated AMI. Good. So non-ST elevated AMI, what is your next step in management if this was a case of non-ST elevated AMI? Don't think from these options. What do you think? So for non-ST elevated AMI, Angioplasty is not an option. Remember, I told, I told you before, so we don't give fibrinolysis, so no thrombolytics, no angioplasty at this moment. Well, if, if we do coronary angiogram and sometimes that patient can need angioplasty later on, but not at the moment. At the moment, what you will do? You will go for low molecular weight heparin for that particular patient. Let's move on. We will come to that question later on. A man come to the emergency department with chest pain for the last hour that is crushing and does not change with respiration or position. ECG shows ST segment depression in lead V2, V4. Aspirin has been given. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Now, the problem is there is no troponin in here. If there was troponin, we would do that. But no troponin. Let's say troponin is not here in the option. What you can do? Because it's not ST segment depression. It's not elevation. Patient having chest pain for the last one hour. Okay. So, like, it can be unstable angina. It can be non-ST elevated AMI, we don't know that. Whatever it is, it's a high risk. We give low molecular weight heparin for this patient. So that's your answer. Heparin will prevent a clot from forming in the coronary arteries. It will not dissolve the clot that has already been formed. 
when the patient has acute coronary syndrome and no ST segment elevation, no benefit of thrombolysis. We might also give morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, but that's not our the most important thing right now because it doesn't reduce mortality like heparin in this case. Okay, so the bottom line is that aspirin is obviously for both ST segment elevated and non elevated MI, but the after aspirin, if it is a ST elevated MI, your most appropriate will be angioplasty. If it's a non ST elevated MI, your most appropriate will be low molecular weight heparin. Okay, clear? Low molecular weight heparin or enoxaparin, deltaparin, these are all the same. But in this case, in this question, if there was option of troponin, we would do that because, I, because that would help us to find out if it is a MI patient or not. So if we look at here, this is like for a stable angina, for unstable or non ST elevated MI and ST elevated MI, these are the management for them. Okay. Look at the here. So for a stable angina, we give aspirin, we give beta blockers, nitrites, but we don't need to do enoxaparin, thrombolytics or antiplatelets, not even clopidogrel. For unstable angina or non ST elevated MI, no thrombolysis, okay, but we give, we give all other things. ST elevated MI, thrombolytics is the most important one, which means the mainly the PCI or thrombolysis. And both of them, like both of them will get heparin, okay. ST elevated MI usually get heparin after thrombolysis, but non-ST elevated MI get it immediately. So we discussed about it. So as soon as possible, we should do that. Now, remember, let's say you have got a non ST elevated MI. Will you stop there? No, you should send the patient for a urgent coronary angiogram. Okay. And after the coronary angiogram, depending on its result, either angioplasty or bypass grafting will be done. Okay. That's right, Dr. Shush Shushmita. So non-ST elevated AMI, we can't say non-ST elevated AMI if we don't see troponin, right? It will become just an acute coronary syndrome. So to diagnose non-ST elevated AMI, we need troponin, okay? And then we can give aspirin and oxaparin. Now, the thing is, like the, the basic thing is, if you, go, if you get someone with one hour chest pain, you would not wait for troponin. You should give the aspirin even before doing a troponin. Okay? That's the thing. Like, aspirin should be given with someone having this sort of chest pain and this lasting for more than an hour. So you give aspirin, send the blood for troponin. In that, so aspirin should come first. That's the thing, okay? So there is a lot of things in here. You guys can go through that these things. It's not very important. We discuss a lot of it. So we discussed about patient with a ST elevated MI who present within 12 hours of the onset of ischemic syndrome should have a PCI or fibrinolysis. Now, some of the things that I want you to remember that First, obviously, I said oxygen is only needed for someone whose oxygen saturation is less than 94. Aspirin for everyone, unless contraindicated, like someone having a bleeding peptic ulcer, you might not give aspirin, but otherwise we would go for it. Nitroglycerin. We, we should not give nitroglycerin or GTN to someone who is having hypotension. Okay, contraindicated. These are, the, these are the ECG finding that we get in terms of their timing 
of chest pain. So sometimes they ask you, what is the immediate finding you will get in the ST elevated MI? So immediate finding is like within, within minutes to hours, you will get this finding, hyperacute T wave, okay? And also immediately after hyperacute T wave, you can get ST segment elevation. One to several days later, then the pathological Q wave appears, which can last for years to like lifelong. And then lastly, T wave inversion can appear. Okay, so this is how the changes happen in the ECG in a patient with ST elevated AMI. We talked about this emergent reperfusion therapy, thrombolysis. Now, these are the contraindication of thrombolytic therapy. These are the patients we will, we will not go for thrombolysis. So absolute contraindication is someone having active bleeding from anywhere or bleeding disorders. Significant closed head or facial trauma within three months. Aortic dissection suspected. Past history of intracranial hemorrhage. Ischemic stroke within the last three months. Any major surgery? in the last three weeks, okay? Active bleeding peptic ulcer, severe poorly controlled hypertension. These patients are contraindicated to go for thrombolysis. Now, late presentation, like if someone present after 12 hours of chest pain, as we say that reperfusion therapy is not routinely recommended in patients who are asymptomatic and hemodynamically stable. But sometimes we might need to go for PCI or fibrinolysis even after 12 hours. If patient is symptomatic, patient is hemodynamically unstable. Now, what could be the complications after doing a PCI or a bypass surgery? So these complications sometimes comes in exam. If in the question they ask you, what is the most common cause of death after a myocardial infarction? What you will say? So most common cause of death after myocardial infarction, anyone? What arrhythmia? Name the arrhythmia. PF, very good, very good. Ventricular fibrillation is the most common cause of death after myocardial infarction. Apart from that, patient can develop heart failure. Patient can develop mechanical disruption like mitral regurgitation, ventricular septal rupture. Patient can also develop post-infarct angina after thrombolytics. Like you, you, you gave a thrombolysis or fibrinolytic agent, but that did not work, okay? and patient again develops chest pain, and you did troponin, it's, or, or if you did CKMB, and it's saying it's elevated after three days. So that patient is developed post-infarct angina, or you can say this patient needs reperfusion, okay? Any patient develops repeat infarction after thrombolytics or PCI, that patient should be treated with bypass surgery, okay? There is a condition called Dresler syndrome. Someone after having a MI, they can develop pericarditis-like feature. And that is called Dresler syndrome. Treatment will be same like aspirin or NSAID. So these are the most common complications that can happen. Next, let's move on to Prince metal angina. What is Prince metal angina? It's very uncommon. It's another name is variant angina. In this case, what happens that patient gets angina-like chest pain due to vasospasm. That means the coronary artery gets sudden spasm. And if there is a spasm of the coronary artery, like this is coronary artery. And when there is a spasm, it becomes like this. So blood is not going. So that patient develops chest pain. 
And if you do ECG, you, even you can get ST segment elevation during that time. Okay, but you did ST segment, you get ST segment elevation, but troponin will not be elevated in this fringe metal angina. So then you can think about Prince metal. ST segment elevated, but troponin normal. Although the spasm almost always terminate spontaneously, sometimes even this can be associated with acute AMI. So treatment will start just same like AMI, as long as you will see that troponin is normal. Now, the important clue to the exam questions will be, typical angina comes with exertion, but Prince metal angina usually occurs during rest, mostly during night and early morning. And it occurs frequently as a epicellular cluster. In these patients, you will get in the ECG during the vasospasm time, you can get ST elevation, but troponin normals. Now, what do you what you will do next? You, you will do exercise tolerance test, and even it, it could be very confusing. So even you can turn, go into a coronary angiogram for this patient, but all of this will give normal result, okay? And sometimes you can trigger coronary artery spasm externally by giving argonovin. So this argonovin vessel spasm test will be positive. So if you give this argonovin, patient will start having the chest pain. Let's confirm the diagnosis. Because it's causing coronary vessel spasm, what medication will help? Something which can dilate coronary arteries. So what can dilate coronary arteries? Calcium channel blocker or nitrite. So any of these two will be helpful for this patient. So this is what I was talking about. During an acute episode of pain and ST segment elevation, you can't tell who has spins metal and who has ST elevated MI. So you must initially treat everyone as a ST segment elevated MI, okay? But eventually that patient will go for a coronary angiogram that will that will be normal. And then you can think about Prince metal. Clear guys, any questions so far? I know that we haven't given you any break tonight, but let's finish the whole class at, in one go, okay? Because there is a flow at the moment, okay? So let's just continue with the flow. You guys are all good? Any question you are having at the moment? Because myocardial infarction is finished, okay? So nothing more in terms of MI or IST. So a lot of discussion, why I took a lot of time, you will know, okay? If you are preparing for MCQ, you will know why I did that. And it's very, very important. And most importantly, most of the candidates get it wrong. Where? These are the things they call mastery questions, and you are not supposed to miss this question. Aortic dissection, let's move on. So aortic dissection, we talk, talked about it. So patient will present to you with a sudden severe midline chest pain, usually situated retrosternally, that will radiate to the back and has a tearing or ripping sensation. Something is like, teared up in the chest. So that will be severe chest pain. Pain not only radiates to the back, but also it can radiate to abdomen, flank, and legs. Some of the important clue will be, there will be inequality in pulses. So like there will be inequality of pulses between right and left radial pulse, femoral pulse, carotid pulse. Even the blood pressure will be different in both limbs. So inequality of blood pressure in both limbs, inequality of pulses in both limbs, that can be a very important finding in aortic dissection. In aortic dissection, if they ask you what is the most appropriate or definitive test you will do, the definitive test is transesophageal echocardiogram. Okay, sometimes we can also do a CT angiogram in this patient. But the best one is transesophageal echocardiogram. 
okay based on most appropriate if they ask that will be two now the management is important and it comes in exam let's have a look first how happens Look at this one. This is called classification of aortic dissection. And this is your aorta. And you can see the dissection or tearing in here. And also there is blood in here, as you can see. This is the false lumen it has caused. Now, aortic dissection has been divided into two subtypes. One is a stand for A, which is also known as proximal aortic dissection, and a stand for B, which is distal aortic dissection. What is proximal and what is distal? Look at these three arteries. One is brachiocephalic, carotid, and subclavian, right? So if, if aortic dissection occurs proximal to these arteries, okay, especially proximal to the subclavian artery, okay, this one, that becomes proximal aortic dissection. Any dissection distal to the subclavian artery is known as distal aortic dissection. Okay, so subclavian artery is our main point. If it is proximal to subclavian, that's your Stanford A. Distal to subclavian, that's your distal. Okay, it's very important because management is totally different. For someone who is having proximal aortic dissection, only management is surgery and is very high mortality risk. For someone having Stanford B or type B aortic dissection or distal aortic dissection, main management is managing the blood pressure. Okay, those sort of patient gets very high blood pressure. So 50% will be hypertensive and not just simple hypertension. It could be like, like malignant hypertension, you can say. So for those patients, you need to control the blood pressure. So how you control them? The initial blood pressure medication we give is called beta blockers. If beta blocker can't help, then you can give IV nitroprusside. You don't start with IV nitroprusside because it can cause a sudden drop of blood pressure, like very suddenly. And that's also not good. So to make a controlled reduction of blood pressure, we start with beta blocker. So you can give IV labetalol. That's also a very good one. So you start with beta blocker, but then you can give IV nitroprusside. So for type B, the main management is medical management. Surgery is not important for them, but emergency surgery is needed for type A. Okay. Any question, guys? So pulmonary embolism, we don't discuss it in our cardiology class because we keep it for respiratory. And that's your finishing of our today's session. Okay. We have another cardiology class. The another cardiology class will be on 5th September. That means day after tomorrow. And we'll finish cardiology with valvular heart disease and also heart failures and some other important topics. Okay, we did finish. I think also hypertension will be included in that, but there is palpitation chapter, which is important for you. We finish palpitation with ECG class. Okay, cool. Any question in our today's session, guys? I hope you guys are understanding what I am. 
talking about. And this is how we take classes, but normally classes um, usually two hour, 30 minutes, but we finished it early today. So we'll just finish it here. Anyone having question like, uh, I can't answer here at the moment, Dr. Sashika, will you please send me a message in my messenger so that I can discuss it with you? Okay, or you can also email me. So this is my email ID. So anyone having any questions regarding the course? Okay, so always email me or just message me in the messenger. We take slides from everywhere, Dr. Sweetie. The slides that you can see, this is from your gym. This is from your gym. So it's a combination of everything. Okay, so in here, there are slides from different books and different websites. So it's a combination of all the important things. Yes, in case of aortic dissection, you, you can do X-ray, but it's not mandatory, okay? But if you do, you will get widening of the mediastinum, okay? But they don't ask you that. They ask you what is the most appropriate investigation for this patient. Yeah, the slides are in, in your uh, software, okay? A role of CT scan, CT angiogram, we do also in aortic dissection sometimes. If, if we can't do toe, like transesophageal echocardiogram, then we can do a CT angiogram. That will also be okay. And the surgery for aortic dissection is for type A, okay, or proximal aortic dissection. Any question? And also one thing is that uh, the course, five months course, Dr. Mohammed, it's, in, it's given in our first aid AMC MCQ group, okay? If you want, just uh, please go through that. Or you can also send us an email or message. We can tag you in our Facebook group details. The lecture note, you should be able to see it in our software already. Have a look in the software if you have got the access or not. So first of all, you need to get an access in the software if you make the payment. then. We take some time to make to give you the access. Okay. Once you get the access, then you will get all these notes at the same time. And yes, this class will be recorded. Recordings are given within 24 hours of the class. So maybe tomorrow, within tomorrow nights, you will be able to see it in our software. And obviously, for this two-week session, you will be given, given the recording in the in our official Facebook group. You can go through that also. So this five months course, if we go, if I go through in a very, very first way, in a concise way, the five months course is, it's a combination of theory and discussing the questions, which means we'll cover the full theory with, with you. Theory means everything that, that is needed for your exam. Then we also have a lot of questions already solved in our software. And we also take a question solution class every week. Okay, so every week there is a class which only for question solution. Mainly we talk about like sample questions, how to solve these questions. So help you with solution of questions. Every week there is one class. And also there is, that means there is three classes every week at the same time. Question solution class is usually taken by 
one of the recent past doctor, okay? And sometimes also I take it. So we take it in combination, okay? But I will take most of the classes of your theory. Not most, every theory classes will be taken by me. And some of the question solvation will be taken by me. And some of the question solvation will be taken by one of the other doctors who recently passed the exam, okay? So three classes every week. And we, also, we always monthly, we update the sample question in your software. We discuss it in that way. There are question bank, which is free of charge. You will get it once you join the course. You get a lot of different mock tests in the software. So there are subjective, like we finish cardiology, then you get a cardiology subjective mock test which you will get it in the software. We update our monthly question, which is a 50 question, like we, for July questions, we do this like July mock exam, 2021, something like that. Just, just to help you or just to deal with these questions, we, we will help you to see that how you are dealing with these questions. And eventually you will know where you are lacking off. And also there are 150 questions, full mock test, which is which we call as a grand mock test in the softwares. Okay. And you will get access to this course note unless you un, until you pass the exam. Recordings will be there in your software also. So that's pretty much everything. So we, we deal with the full thing in five months. You should be prepared for your exam. But we would say that you should have your study partner who will help you to help you with your study also and you can solve questions with them. We have our group in the Telegram also, who like for our course students, who, uh, with whom you can solve questions and make your study partner if you want. Then what else? That's I think pretty much everything. So it's a combination of theory and sample questions, which, which is only thing that you need for passing this exam, okay? And yes, Dr. Annie, so three times a week, there are classes. Any questions regarding the course? 